Oh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, to the people on Zoom, we have no camera in the room tonight. So all of these lovely people in attendance, you will not be able to see, but you will be able to see the presentation. So that's what's most important. I'm going to begin with our acknowledgement statement. The town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that we are located in the traditional and treaty territory of the Michisiga and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which includes Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Bosali, and Georgina Island First Nations. The town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty Nations have been stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters, and that today remain vigilant over their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Welcome to our 70th anniversary celebration. Seven. Seven decades of nature exploration, education and preservation. And it's truly something to be proud of. And I thank you, our membership for your continued support. You made us the great club that we are today. Please stay afterward for refreshments um, and share all of your club mem memories because we want to hear all your stories. Um, are there any new members here? First meeting tonight. You can just put up your hand. Yay! Sure. We're going to really welcome our, our new members here tonight. That's fabulous. Uh, Marina sent out a survey to our membership last month, um, and we had a great response, over 30%. Uh, Marina's tabulating the results, and she'll be presenting it to our board next week. And then again, it'll come out to you either in an email or in the curlew after that. A uh, little reminder that our formal meetings will cease during the summer months and that our outings will continue. So that's great. Um, so please join us if you're able to on any of those outings. And on that note, I will call up our outing coordinator, Richard, to join us. Thank you, Whitney. Well, I hope you uh, have all been out uh, enjoying this great weather, doing some birding and uh, taking in uh, the nature because that sunshine is <laughs> finally is so beautiful out there, even though it might be a little cool. Um, just to uh, report on, on the outings, uh, we did have an outing on May the 13th um, that was just Mark Rupke and myself, unfortunately, um, the pond study. But we did have a wonderful morning. It was beautiful, sunny and warm, and it was, it was a lovely day in the woods. <laughs> um, tomorrow morning, um, the uh, Northumberland Land Trust is uh, hosting a, an early morning birding outing at uh, McEwen Nature Reserve. I know I've talked to at least one person that's going to be there besides myself. And uh, uh, so that's, I'm looking forward to that. Um, early in June, and the, the date is to be announced yet, there's going to be an evening birding event uh, uh, at uh, Marina Scassa's uh, property. Uh, and uh, it'll be gone into dusk. Uh, so looking to hear uh, whippoorwills and maybe some uh, nighthawks uh, uh, and uh, evening birds. So the, uh, watch for that dates to be announced, uh, but that will be early in June. Uh, on June the 17th, uh, the uh, Northumberland Land Trust is hosting uh, the uh, uh, shorelines, uh, lake shorelines, and wetlands at uh, Jack Van Nostrum Nature Reserve, and that's going to be led by David Keel. Uh, on uh, June the 24th, uh, we are hosting a wildflower outing at the Hazel Bird uh, Nature Reserve, and that'll be led by Val Dezeal. On uh, July the 9th, uh, there will be a butterfly outing. Um, the locations to be announced and that'll be led by Roger Frost. 
And we don't have any outings yet scheduled for August, but uh, watch for that because we will be, we have a, an outings committee meeting here in a couple of weeks and we'll be working on, on events for August. September, uh, there is uh, the date to be announced. It will be a, a fall fungi um, outing and that'll be at Peters Woods led by uh, Radek uh, Podolchik. So uh, watch for those dates. And now, if any of you have suggestions for outings that you would like to do, or you'd like to participate in, or lead, love, or lead absolutely, or lead, uh, I would be happy to talk with you and, uh, uh, and explore what we might be able to come up with. So thank you very much. And Elizabeth. I'm wearing several hats tonight, uh, so I'll start. I'll start with the summer bird count. The summer bird count will be held on June the uh, 10th and 11th this year. It's a Saturday and a Sunday. It's sort of two half days usually. If anybody wants to take part, you can contact Roger or you can tell me tonight. And uh, there are. It's. I. Don't, we haven't organized anything for afterwards yet because we haven't been able to. Been able to. Uh, because of COVID, but this year we thought we might try and get a gathering after the after the count. So um, you need to be able to be to identify birds pretty much by sound <laughs> for this one because you often don't see very many things. And if anybody just wants to bird around their own property, you can let us know as well that you're going to do that. Might save us a bit of work too. So that's that hat. So next hat is sightings. We've had, what's the first, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, first picture, yeah. This picture I asked to, specifically to be put up. Has anybody seen one this year yet? This is a wimbrel. And I asked this to be put up because this is the 70th anniversary and the Hudsonian curlew was the old name of the wimbrel. If you didn't get it in, the, in Marina's uh, puzzle, it was in the puzzle, but, but it used to be the, na the name of this bird. It's been changed to Wimbrel now, but that's why our publication is called The Curler, and that's why it's the logo of the club. So just a little history there. Next. Anybody else see any? There have been lots of shorebirds, apparently, at the harbor in the last few days. Anybody else want to? Yeah, Matt. Uh, today I saw three ruddy turnstones at the Coburn Harbor. Ruddy turnstones? But lots of Dunlin, I understand. Who saw those? I didn't see them. I... Margaret, did you go up out to there? I went to Fort Hope Harbor yesterday, and that was absolutely great. Um, the fishermen there, and uh, it was very nice, and there were huge um, flocks of Dunlin. Hundreds, I think. Hundreds of Dunlin in Port Hope Harbor yesterday. I didn't know there'd be anything in Port Harbor. Port Hope Harbor. There's so much construction going on around there. Yes, but, uh, but it keeps the fishermen away. Yeah. Uh, so it's black-bellied plovers. Black-bellied plovers. One golden plover, which Margaret couldn't find. I don't know who found it, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You might mention to people that tomorrow is is the classic Wimbrel. Oh, oh yes, Wim, Wim, Wimbrel usually pass through on about the twenty fourth of May, and they pass through in great numbers at Willow Beach, which is an actual place, which we don't have access to anymore. But it is a place. It's, the beach isn't as much anymore either. But yeah. Oh, let's go back. This one is special. Two pairs of piping plovers have turned up at Presque Isle this, this uh, spring, so we're very hopeful that they might nest. I hope the, I haven't been down there, so I'm not sure what the water is like or what the water level is like. If the water is too high, they don't have places to nest. Have you been? Is it high tish? So there's no dry beach. They need dry beach. Well, we'll see. But that they have turned up, and I I haven't heard it, who where they're from because most of them are banned. So we probably would know uh, where they hatched. Yeah. And then Sherwood McLernand, uh, I think yesterday, had a red-headed woodpecker at his feeder. 
There have also been uh, a pair seen in the Alderville area. So if you're up in that area, have a look because you know have or have a listen. Roger says they sound like a wimpy red belly woodpecker. That's a problem. And this is a really special bird that uh, Suzanne Williams turned up yesterday at Coburn Harbor. This is a black leg kittiwake. Black leg kittiwakes are rare in Ontario at any time. They're an ocean going gull. And they're incredibly rare in the spring and incredibly rare that it's a full adult. And it was around this morning until the work started, the dredging started in the harbor and the workmen flushed it. So. And that's all our pictures, I think. Anybody else have anything? Richard? You didn't mention the Marina Scott's. Uh, I'm sorry. I could find the cat down with Red Cross. Yes, I'm sorry. I, that was on the list and I missed it. Uh, Marina found a, a Red Cross bill nest up in the Northumberland Forest. And Red Cross bills are very difficult to confirm that they're nesting because. The females don't leave the nest and the male brings her food. So they never, you never see them carrying food to the babies. So that's, I think that's a really good one. So there's been a, not so much songbird activity. There were a couple of good days. I think maybe the Sunday of the long weekend was a good day. I'm not sure. Anybody else have anything they want to? Yeah. Uh, I just thought I was sitting on the beach at Crestfield this morning. Yeah. And and the beach is because the wind was fairly high, it's flooding and there's strong west winds. So the, the plumbers, if they're gonna make it, they have to have something against the bushes. Um but I took this morning and there were uh, a couple of red knots uh, and about 60 short birds, but more distress more distressing was. There were about 25 photographers all over the beach walking up on all the other groups and within an hour but the bird of the beach. And these are these are people who are not bird watchers or something. They they don't even know what they're photographing, but this is sort of a new a relatively new phenomenon that's being ramped up and there's no understanding or knowledge or anything of that. It is, so that's something we're going to have to address. Yeah. It's pretty sad to see this one. I've never seen a beach that like crowded. Yeah, that, that is unfortunate, Doc. Is, so the, the, the plovers, do, do you know where the plovers are from? Um, they're, they're in the beach. Uh, they're not. They're sort of moving around and disappearing and reappearing, and one of them is dead. No, I just wondered from the bands where they originated. Uh, it's apparently a chick from the Link Spirit of Crestfield, and one is a chick from Darling. Okay, one. And then one's from I'm going to have to say that again, Doug, because of the people on, on one uh, Zoom. One from New York State, one from and, uh, one last year's Crestfield. It seems they've got like three or four sites and they just move around pretty freely. It depends where the beach is. Yeah. But it, it's it's not looking good on the rescue beach, just in a it's uh, there's too much water. It, it's a pure it's, it. I mean, it's dry in the day, but if you get sustained west wind and pushes the wave over that crest will flood the back. Yeah. Which is great yeah. for other stuff. <laughs> yes, and and just in case for those of you who don't know, some of those shorebirds may have flown from Chesapeake Bay to Presque Isle nonstop, and if the wind hadn't been bad, they might have gone right on to James Bay. They can fly that far in one shot. Yeah, so the re if they come down to rest, it's really important that they do have an opportunity to rest and feed on the beach. Richard. Just to. Uh... One thing I mentioned to people tomorrow, uh, Saturday and Sunday, the bloody dredging machines not going to probably work at the Coburg's Harbor. And the 26th, 7th, and 8th are the key dates for the outer breakwater in the Coburg Harbor for red knots and numerals. Unfortunately, I can't go tomorrow morning because Margaret's going to get out. It's only like got the hour and a half up in the woods. Because uh, you can see the ripples with your naked eye. It's okay. And the red, the red knots 
uh, say if the sun's already dead in the past year, I mean, we have a good chance of having Moana Creek water in with the turn stones and black belly plumber. So. so, anybody that isn't at listening tomorrow morning in the forest, <laughs> be down at the harbor. <laughs> so, you, with, with your binoculars and your scope, probably. Anybody have anything else that you want to report? Yeah. Uh, I saw a great egrets at the Cobra. I don't know what it's actually called. It is, but it flew out of the creek that was there. Oh. A great egret at the golf course in Cobra. It's a nice pond there, too. So I saw about three or four Canada warblers today at Goodrich Loomis Conservation. Goodrich Loomis, four Canada warblers. That's pretty good. And then at the county, it's not a bird, but at the county forest two weeks ago, we, I saw two large adult hognose snakes. Two hognose snakes in the forest. Yeah, that's special as well. Is there also listed? I guess that's it, Sarah. So now I'm changing hats to introduce our speaker. So it's my very pleasant task now to introduce Professor Bridget Stutchbury, Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of Biology at York University, Toronto, as our speaker this evening. She did her MSc at Queen's University, her PhD at Yale, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. Since the 1980s, she has studied migratory songbirds to understand their behavior, ecology, and conservation. She is the author of Silence of the Songbirds, in, which was published in 2007, and The Bird Detective, published in 2010, and was featured in the award-winning 2015 documentary, The Messenger. She has also been a long-serving board member for Wildlife Preservation Canada, whose uh, mission is to prevent animal extinctions, including the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike. The first time I heard Bridget speak was a presentation to the Toronto Ornithological Club, probably about 30 years ago. At this time, wearable tech had finally been made small enough that it could be put onto songbirds. And so it could be used to study their behavior and migration paths. At the time, Bridget was a pioneer in the use of geolocators. She last spoke to this club in the early spring of 2010. We look forward to being updated on the most recent discoveries of her studies. Welcome, Dr. Bridget Stutchbury. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, you have to turn off your screen sharing so that I can turn mine on. Can people on Zoom hear me? All good? I can't share a screen until you turn your screen sharing off. Here we go. Thanks. Hey, well, thank you for inviting me to speak to your club tonight. It's really exciting that this is your 70th uh, anniversary. I'm really happy to share this with you, even though I'm over Zoom. It's uh, it's still um, really an honor to be able to speak to you uh, for this celebration. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my, my migration tracking research, um, which, as was said before, like started with using geolocators, but more recently I've been using the MODIS wildlife tracking system. So I'll be talking about several different studies I've done uh, since we started geolocator tracking in, in uh, the late 2000s to try to give you a feel for what we've discovered, some of the things we've discovered about songbird migration, uh, but also um, with the theme of trying to uh, address questions around why are songbirds declining? Because we know that so many species in Canada and North America as a whole have shown long-term population declines. And really the motivation for my research is partly discovery of, of interesting, fascinating behaviors, but, uh, but more so trying to get insights as to what of the many possibilities might explain declines of particular species. So of course, if we're studying uh, migratory songbirds, um, one of the, one of the um, 
fiddling around. But one of the biggest challenges of understanding songbird declines is that they travel over such massive distances and occupy very, very different sites at different times of the year. So if you wanted to understand you know, Wilson's warbler population trends, you would have to study them on their breeding grounds. You would have to study their migration routes and where they stop over. And you would have to study them on their wintering grounds. That could take somebody you know, decades <laughs> to do all those studies or they'd need a very, very large team of people doing simultaneous work. Uh, and so when, when people sort of get a little bit frustrated that, that we don't know for a given species why they're declining, uh, it's because the question is really, really hard to study given how mobile these tiny little birds are. So one of the most exciting things that's happened during my long career at York University is a discovery and um, an implementation of technologies that allow us to track all or part of bird migration remotely. Um, back before 2009, there was really no way for songbirds to track them uh, over multiple days. The, the closest that we came to it were these crazy scientists, Bill Cochran and uh, Martin Wykelski, you can see their old station wagon here. Uh, they would tag Swainson's thrushes with radio transmitters that lasted a couple of days. And then on the, on the night that the bird left the local area, they would chase after it in a car, detecting the radio signal coming down from above so that they could find out where the bird landed after this three, four or five hour flight. But then uh, um, my lab was the one that discovered not geolocators themselves, but the way that we could put these tiny geolocator devices on songbirds before they had been used on large birds like geese and albatross. But uh, they were finally made small enough for a large songbird to carry. And I'll show you some of these migration maps. But for the first time in 2009, we were able to to estimate the start to finish migration trip of an individual bird in this case showing fall migration down to the Amazon, winter time movements within the wintering grounds and then spring migration shown here in red. So we had a pretty good idea of the route that an individual took and how long they spent at each stopover site. And then finally, um, we were able to, you, the, and that wasn't myself, but Bird Studies Canada developed the MODIS wildlife tracking system um, where we there's I'll explain later there's a hundreds of these um, radio receiver towers set up now in eastern North America and beyond and when a bird flies by the tower and he's carrying a radio transmitter the tower automatically detects its presence so we don't get start to finish migration but we do get pieces of the puzzle um, which is also extremely valuable and and well suited for answering some kinds of questions so for geolocators, most people probably know how they work, but they're, they're little devices that the bird carries like a backpack on its back. And at the end, uh, there's a little tiny light sensor. So what these devices do, they're not GPS tags, but rather uh, they're sensing day and night. In particular, they're able to tell you the timing of sunrise and sunset wherever the bird happened to be on that day. So when you download the data, these are the light levels and you can see it's very, very dark then suddenly it gets light because the sun came up and then it's bright all day and then it gets down to sunset again. So by looking up the date and the times of sunrise and sunset, you can guesstimate to within a hundred, couple of hundred kilometers where the bird was on that day. So this was the first time uh, we first put our, put our first tags on in 2007. Uh, we were the first people in the world to use these tags on songbirds and it was really spectacular to catch a bird in the spring carrying its little backpack, download the data at the end of the day when you got home to your computer and be able to create one of these migration maps within 10 or 15 minutes showing you where that bird has been for the last year is really incredible. So what kinds of questions can we answer about bird conservation by using these kind of tracking technologies?
So the first study that I want to talk about, uh, we did multiple studies on purple martins tracking uh, various aspects of their bird migration and, and, and timing. But when we, the first study that we did, we were really, really interested in where different purple martin populations went on the wintering grounds. So you can see, um, just closing the chat here, you can see the breeding grounds of the eastern race of purple martins uh, covers all of eastern North America, and then there's a little bit going up into Alberta here. And then the wintering grounds, if you look at most maps, cover a large part of South America with most of the wintering range being somewhere in Brazil. So this is what we knew before we had migration tracking technology. And what we were really curious about was why northern populations of purple martins, not all of them, but most of them, many of them are declining. So in this is from the breeding bird survey. Most of the northern populations in here in eastern Canada and throughout southern Ontario and some of the northern states, they show long-term declines. And so there's a really this huge area here where purple martins have been dec declining quite dramatically over the past 20, 30 years. So now that we could track individual birds, we wondered if those northern populations are going to a place in South America where they're facing unique kinds of threats. I kind of thought that maybe the northern populations are going to southern Brazil where there's a lot of agriculture and maybe they're exposed to pesticides. Whereas in the north, where there's lots of forest, maybe they're not. So how did we uh, do this study? We put these geolocators as a little backpack on purple martins, and we tracked hundreds of purple martins. But this is an example of one migration map of one of the very first birds that we're able to track. So our study site is here on the, sh on the shore of Lake Erie, uh, near Erie, Pennsylvania. And this bird, uh, these birds roost in a large roost on the shoreline. And we know that, it, uh, that the bird hung around the roost until the 29th of August. And then suddenly, the next day, it races, it races down to central US on the East Coast. Within three days, it's at the southern tip of Florida. So this is very characteristic of most purple martins for some reason they migrate extremely rapidly once they start, just a few days to get out of the US. So that was very surprising. And then the rest of the migration is kind of slow. So you can see here, if you can read that the bird was in Cuba just for a few days, spent a week in the Yucatan, sort of goes through Central America reasonably quickly and ends up down here in Brazil by the 26th of September. So it took almost a month to get from start to finish, but the half of the trip was covered in just a few days. And what was really surprising to me is that this bird wintered in the Amazon rainforest. So this is uh, the, the Amazon River kind of goes through, the, through here. So this bird spent most of the winter in the Amazon rainforest. And another surprise was that they didn't, the bird didn't stay in one place all winter. We really don't know much about how birds move around on their wintering grounds because we haven't had the technology before to detect long distance movements. But you can see here on the 3rd of February, this bird flew suddenly the next day, quite a few hundred kilometers up to the Northeast where it spent the rest of its winter before it came home. So you can see here, just looking at the migration track of a single bird, uh, that we've already had a lot of surprises um, sort of about what, what we assumed birds did on migration. So when we look at these wintering grounds here, what do they do on the wintering grounds? Some people are very familiar with purple martin roosts, but this is what they do every single night on migration and during their time in Brazil. They gather in these massive roosts that can easily contain over 100,000 birds. And these roosts are usually found in a small patch of trees in a park, if you're in an urban area, or on a tiny island. We've, we've used a GPS tracking now to track some of them to islands in the Amazon River. 
So they like to gather in sort of island locations and they probably gather in massive numbers just for safety. It's pretty hard for predators to pick off individual birds when there's 100,000 swarming around in the air and the trees. And some of these roost sites uh, are very traditional. We know at least uh, the one in Erie, for instance, has been Erie, Pennsylvania, where we've been working. They, they had roosts there for 40 years and it's always in exactly the same place. As to why birds might move from one roost site to another, hundreds of kilometers away, we really don't know why individual birds would do this. Only about half the martins make these movements during the winter and switch sites. Uh, and so that's it's an interesting question, but we really don't know why they're doing it. And then uh, coming home in the in the spring, you can see this this is the same bird. It left on the 15th of April. And instead of traveling slowly, it races up to the Yucatan and then across the Gulf of Mexico and back to Pennsylvania. So this bird traveled, it took a month to get to Brazil, but only two weeks to get back. And here we can assume that the bird is in a hurry because they wanna get a good spot in the birdhouse and also attract a female. So to answer our original question of like, are the Northern populations going somewhere different than the ones in the Southern US, we had collaborators, landlords, who had these purple martin colonies in their backyards, or at public sites. And so we tracked birds from across the range of the Eastern population. And we also had a collaborator on Vancouver Island who put a few tags on the Western subspecies. And you can see here from the graph, uh, the map, that birds from all over the East completely mix up in the Amazon rainforest. There is no segregation of these populations once they get to the wintering grounds. You can literally have birds from Alberta, Texas and Virginia wintering side by side in the same roost in the Amazon River. So our idea, my original idea that Northern populations were going somewhere different was, was wrong, as it turns out. Uh, what, what is kind of interesting is that this Western subspecies, you know, they don't interbreed. The Western subspecies actually leapfrogs over all of this area. I mean, they pass through it. And they do winter in southeastern uh, Brazil in a completely different type, type of habitat. You can see this is the Amazon rainforest here. The Amazon River comes through the middle here. There's a Rio Negro, so Manaus is around in here. Heavily forested, like 80, 90% forest cover where purple martins are. So their wintering habitat is largely intact, especially in the western Amazon. Very interesting. There, there's almost no agriculture there. But with these, um, the Western populations of purple martins, you can see their habitat is almost entirely deforested, but nobody has really studied them very carefully. We don't really know much about their ecology and behavior and the threats that they face. So purple martins are still kind of a question mark. Why are they declining in the North? Not, we're not entirely sure, it's frustrating. The other study that we did on geolocators was done on wood thrushes. You can see a, a wood thrush here with his geolocator backpack feeding his young. We usually catch them when they're feeding young to stick the tags on because it's easy to catch them then. And here's another migration map kind of showing uh, what we know for purple for uh, wood thrushes. Um, I'm just going to show you the spring migration map for now to make it simpler. But this bird, again, from northwestern Pennsylvania, where, where my research site is, now this bird spent the entire winter in northern Honduras. So it brought, arrived here on the 1st of November and left on the 21st of April. Again, I can't emphasize how spectacular it is to actually find out what individual birds are doing so far away. And this is the typical migration route that they take back. Um, the birds will fly quickly up to the Yucatan Peninsula, cross the Gulf of Mexico, Almost all the wood thrushes will land somewhere in this Mississippi River Delta. This is New Orleans, of course. And then they come up through the Mississippi River Valley to come back to their breeding site. And again, it's pretty rapid. 21st of April, the bird leaves Honduras and it's back on its breeding territory uh, by the 3rd of May. Again, an interesting thing that we discovered is that about 10% of birds take a different route. Same sort of wintering area come up to the Yucatan by the 1st of May, but then this bird chickens out, so to speak, 
and goes around the Gulf. And you can see how slow it's going. It takes many days to go around the corner and it doesn't get to the US um, Mexico border until the 18th of May. And then finally back on the 26th of May, ironically. So this bird took almost a month to get back, presumably because it had to travel so very far. And it was one of the last females to arrive at the study site and start building a nest. And if we hadn't tracked this bird, we would have had no idea why it's so incredibly late. For some reason, it did not proceed to cross the Gulf of Mexico. So what can we use the, this geolocator information for to help us understand why wood thrushes are declining? Well, first of all, again, if we um, track birds from many, many different populations, this is just showing birds from the Northeast because that's where we are right now, we can sort of put together what is the most typical migration route. So in the fall, our birds, wood thrushes, go down the eastern seaboard. Most of them pass through Florida in one place or another. A lot of them pass through Western Cuba, and a lot of them pass through the Yucatan. So out of that whole huge area where wood thrushes could possibly migrate, we can at least narrow down where the important stopover sites are for birds in the fall. Florida, Western Cuba, and the Yucatan. Now in spring, it's different. Again, this is frustrating because conservation is hard. Protecting lands, forested lands, is hard. Unfortunately, wood thrushes don't go there and back the same way. In the spring, as I showed you, they come up to the Yucatan, cross the Gulf of Mexico, and come up the Mississippi River Valley somewhere. Almost none of the birds come back through Florida. So yes, we need to protect forested lands in Florida for fall migration, but on spring migration, you have to look farther west and protect the lands in the Mississippi River Delta and along this flyway here. Again, just showing how very difficult it is to implement conservation actions for particular species. As I mentioned, wood thrushers are declining dramatically across much of their range, uh, like purple martins in the north, and so our focus was on, you know, what role does forest fragmentation and forest loss play uh, in the wood thrush declines? So like the purple martins, we did a massive tracking study with collaborators and tracked purple martin populations across much of the eastern part of their range where they're especially common. And the colors here show the breeding populations where the birds were tagged and the matching colors down here show where the birds wintered, individual birds wintered. And here's the red star for our Northwestern Pennsylvania research site uh, where we did most of the tracking. So if you've just focused on the red ones for now, here's the breeding site. And you can see in gray out of all the areas wood thrush could winter from Panama up into Mexico, almost all of our birds, like I showed you, uh, winter in uh, Eastern Honduras uh, or Nicaragua, or maybe the, the tiny portion of the Northwestern corner of Costa Rica. So these birds do, unlike the purple martins, they do zero in on one particular area. And what's interesting, I'm gonna show you, is that the birds from the sort of central part of the breeding area have a different wintering site. So if you look at the black and yellow stars, the breeding sites, these birds focus on Mexico and Guatemala as their wintering area. And so even, so it's very, um, very, very different to what I showed you about purple martins. They don't mix up completely on the winter grounds. The northern birds go here and the central birds go to a different place. And so now we can look at what's happening in those wintering areas to find out how much forest loss has taken place in these two different sites. Could it be that wood thrushes are declining because of forest loss on the wintering grounds? So this is the main wintering area, as I showed you, for northeastern breeders. And the Midwestern and sort of southern more populations kind of winter in here. The colors on the map are taken from remote sensing, where there, I didn't do this, but the data are publicly available. How much forest loss has occurred in different five-year periods um, as detected from satellite? And in red, it's showing you, like you can see these red sites in here and in here. 15 to 35% of the forest was cut in only five years in those sites. And in orange, it's five to 25%.
So this area in say Northern Guatemala here is a deforestation hotspot on a global level. Like it's, this is just like one of the worst areas in the world for deforestation. And here in Eastern Nicaragua, where a lot of the Northeastern breeders go, that's also a globally significant deforestation hotspot. And if you look at the forecast in Nicaragua over time, what, what the, look in the past, how much forest cover was there and what's the forecast, you can see that this forest loss has continued. And this is the same time frame over which we see the massive decline in wood thrushes. So forest loss has been extreme in Nicaragua, which probably explains why we see such a dramatic decline in wood thrushes from that uh, breeding bird survey over the last 40 years. I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit for the second half of this talk and talk, and, and talk about a different technology. We talked about the MODIS wildlife tracking system. I'll explain what it is but we've been using it uh, extensively on wood thrushes um, by tagging birds in Norfolk County near the, the, um, the Long Point Bird Observatory. And so we've done parallel studies. These are my PhD students, Brendan Boyd and Sue Hayes, who did parallel studies. Brendan was studying the adults by radio tagging them and using the MODIS tower system to look at when the adults begin fall migration because we know from the MODIS towers the exact day and time that they start leaving, that they just take off. And because the radio tags can last a whole year, we can also detect with this tower array system when they come back in the spring. In other words, how many birds survive migration? And our overarching question was, do birds nesting in small forest fragments carry this long-term cost of having their migration delayed or even having lower survival during migration because of where they nested. Small fragments are considered poor habitat. There's more predators, there's less food. So parents who end up breeding in small fragments could really pay a price for this even after they finished breeding. That's the question. And Sue had the same exact question about these radio check juveniles. You can see a little juvenile wood thrush here. He hasn't grown his tail yet. He's fledged. He's got little leg bands on and here's the radio transmitter antenna, you know, coming off the back there. They wear them as backpacks as well. So we asked the same question, you know, how about the juveniles that are raised in small fragments? Do they have some sort of long-term disadvantage because they're raised in a stressful environment with perhaps with less food and more predators? So this, nobody's ever been able to look at this sort of question before because it requires the technology of this MODIS tracking system. So what is MODIS? The MODIS wildlife tracking system is amazing because you don't have to have the bird return the next year carrying its backpack. It's okay if you never see it again. So here's what the little radio tags look like. They're tiny. We mount them on the bird's back, a little bit of the backpack kind of harness. And then there's hundreds of these towers scattered across the landscape. And while the bird's flying at night, if it passes within five or 10 kilometers of a tower, the tower detects it automatically. And then we get the data automatically and can analyze for each individual bird where it was detected, uh, when it started migration, et cetera. So this is very different than the geolocators because you know pretty much exactly where the bird is. Um, and as I said, you can get information on birds that don't even come back the next summer. And we chose a, a Norfolk County for the study because Bird Studies Canada kind of invented this motor MODIS tower system and put in MODIS towers uh, at very high density. So you have almost complete coverage, here's Long Point, of this whole study area. So as a bird, so, and the white um, outlines here are the different forest fragments that we studied in. So Bacchus Woods is one of these two, and we have a lot of tiny ones. So we, we're comparing birds from really large patches of forest like Bacchus Woods to tiny little fragments uh, that are only like 30 hectares in size or less. And as a bird leaves on migration, it would be pretty hard for it to head south across Lake Erie without being detected by a tower. So that allows us for adults and juveniles 
to capture that first departure on fall migration. So we can look at the timing of fall migration in great detail. And if you look at this panel here, this shows the, the tower array throughout North America. Not only can we detect birds in our local little region, but if birds go down, say, across the North Shore of Lake Erie, or go down this eastern seaboard, which is one of their main migration routes, or through Florida, we can pick up these birds uh, quite, a, quite a distance from their breeding site and confirm that they're alive. So I'm not going to show you a lot of the data from, uh, from this study because the, the, basically the answer is no. We didn't find any evidence that small fragments are a disadvantage to these birds on fall migration. I'll show, you, I'll show you a couple of graphs for the adults uh, so you can get a feel for, for what, what, the, you know, what the graphs look like, what the, what the evidence is. So this is the date on which individual birds started their fall migration. So in our population, uh, some birds left as early as looks like 8th of September, and, uh, and some of them stayed until the 10th of October. So the really wide, almost a one month variation between different individuals and when they started migrating. And along the x-axis here, this shows the size of the forest fragment they were breeding in, anywhere from these tiny ones that are only like 10 hectares or so in size to some of the bigger ones like Bacchus Woods, that's over 400 hectares. So small fragments really had a, had a like a, a long cost, long-term cost to breeding birds, um, you would expect it to show up in these kinds of data because we have such a wide range of fragment sizes. But you can see the lines are almost flat. There's really no evidence that the breeding in a small fragment is, uh, delays fall migration. And the other thing we looked at was whether or not the birds return in the spring. This is a measure of survival because as far as we understand for adults, a lot of birds will return to the same territory or a nearby forest fragment as they occupied um, the year before. And so overall, uh, MODIS was able to detect 39% of our tagged adults coming back the next spring, um, which is pr pretty typical of what you would get from band returns where you band adults and then look, you know, visually look for them with your binoculars the next year. We usually get 40 to 50% of adults coming back the next year. And it's always been thought that adult survival is indeed around 40 or 50%. So we think we're detecting most of the adults that are alive. And again, our key question was whether nesting in a small fragment somehow carried the price of lowering that bird's chances of surviving migration. Uh, but you can see here that, uh, that there's really no evidence for that at all. For the birds that are nesting in small, small fragments, uh, you get about 40% coming back. And for the ones in the larger fragments, you get about 40% of the ones coming back. Um, and so this is good news that although small fragments lower nesting success of, of birds because there's lots of predators there, those adult birds have a really, really good chance of migrating on time and coming back the next year and trying again. So these small fragments might be more valuable than we think in terms of conservation. Well, we did, so we did the same thing for, uh, for the, the nestlings because this is their very first migration ever. They're totally naive when they leave on fall migration. They've never done it before. Uh, and so although we didn't see any costs of the parents, maybe it would show up in the, in the juveniles. Uh, and with the MODIS tracking system, 26% of our 200 juveniles that we tracked, 200, 26% of them uh, were able to come back the next spring. So this is a measure of survival. There might be a few you know, that, that came back to a different place that we never detected. But remember, the MODIS towers are all over the place. Um, so we have a, a reasonable chance of detecting birds that are alive, even if we never see them again. And as with the adults, uh, forest fragment size, where they were, you know, the, the, the size of the fragment where the, that nestling had been raised did not affect fall migration time or spring return which again, you know, sort of makes us think that, that at least for wood thrushes in southwestern Ontario, these small forest fragments are pretty good places to nest. And in fact, nest predation wasn't even very high in these small fragments. Uh, and so we should be placing higher value on, uh, on what these small fragments can contribute to our forest songbirds in terms of allowing them to breed and survive.
so as I said, you know, we're, the view is often being that these large forest patches are almost essential for con conserving songbirds. Well, that is true for some species, but at least for wood thrushes, uh, even these small fragments have high value in terms of protecting them and uh, making sure that they're high quality habitat. The last study that I'm going to cover just in the, in the last few minutes um, also used the MODIS wildlife tracking system. Uh, but in this case, we were studying white crowned sparrows. And the question was completely different. And it was more designed to test whether a particular th threat, um, whether, we could, whether we could show a negative effect of pesticides by doing experiments on the birds. So the other two studies we're just sort of observing what the birds do and we're not manipulating them or doing an experiment. Um, but we all know that the that neonicotinoid pesticides uh, have become extremely common over the last 10 or 15 years. And there's a huge amount of concern about their effect on pollinators, specifically uh, native, native bees and also honeybees, because of course, a lot of our food in the grocery store needs to be pollinated. And the irony of using neonicotinoids to control uh, insect pests is that it also affects uh, the pollinators that we need to, to actually make the fruits that we're eating. So there's been a huge amount of concern and, and many, and I have a colleague at York who, who exclusively studies pesticides and honeybees. They found all kinds of subtle effects of these pesticides on honeybee behavior, honeybee orientation. People have done studies on native bees now. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, what about other types of animals? And we were very, very interested. And I say we, uh, this is a study that was done with Christy Morrissey uh, at University of Saskatchewan. And we co-supervised a postdoctoral fellow, um, Margaret Eng, who had uh, happened to have done a master's deg degree with me a number of years ago. And so they led the study. I mean, I'm not an ecotoxicologist, but Christy is, and so is Margaret. Uh, so we kind of got our heads together to do the first ever sort of controlled dosing study um, to see whether these pesticides impair songbird migration. So I'll just briefly explain uh, the, the setup. Um, it, the, the first study we did was a captive study. So then this was done in Saskatchewan. So they caught migrating sparrows, the white crowned sparrows on their way north, caught them and then put them indoors in an aviary. Then they had a period where they allowed the birds just to get used to captivity. Uh, and then they tested them. I'll explain this in a minute. They tested them in an indoor, in a, in a sort of what uh, it's called an Emlyn funnel, but they tested them to see how well they can tell north from south. And then uh, for the birds that were being treated with pesticides, they got three, uh, one dose over each of three different days. It's trying to simulate what a bird might do if it's feeding on a stop on a three day stopover. If it happens to be in a edge of a field or some place where there's some uh, pesticide treated seeds that happen to be dropped or spilled, then uh, then this would simulate a stopover. And then they tested their orientation again, uh, and then they and then then they tested them two weeks later. And you'll see the data in a minute. And a key here is that what that they chose a dosing level that's supposed to be very, very plausible of what birds might encounter in the field, which is the equivalent of three canola seeds that have been treated with with uh, imidacloprid, the, the neonicotinoid that we're studying. So it's quite reasonable to think that a bird might eat three contaminated seeds in the course of one day. And then if it stays in that place, it'll do it again the next day and again the next day. So what did we find out from this captive study? So in black here, the black line and circles shows the control birds. By control, I mean those birds were treated exactly the same way, had the same housing, had the same amount of food, except they didn't get any pesticides. And you can see that the control birds are able to maintain their body mass over the whole experiment. From the time of capture, to getting the, the, in this case, you know, fake dosing. And then two days post-release, they're very, very healthy in captivity. They're eating, they're doing well. <clears throat> the birds that are dosed, either at a low dose or a high dose, you can see what happens to them. Their body mass just crashes over the few days where they're receiving these tiny doses of pesticides. They basically stop eating. 
And as soon as you stop giving them the pesticide, their body mass eventually recovers by the time the two week experiment is uh, post two weeks. So these birds had, had full access to as much food as they wanted, but they still lost massive amounts of body weight. <clears throat> what about migration orientation? <clears throat> This is how it's tested without actually letting the birds go. These are called Emlyn funnels. And there's a screen cover over the top and you can see the birds inside each one. And the birds are exposed to uh, the outdoors, right? So they're actually outside. <clears throat> and birds orient uh, around sunset by using a number of cues, uh, polarized light from the sun, and also being able to look at the stars and tell north from south. And birds also can sense magnetic fields through their vision. Uh, so they have a, different modes of detecting north from south. And so that's why the tests are done outside. And so these circular plots are really confusing to look at, but let me explain one of them. And I think, and they're all this, they, you can interpret them all the same way. So here's a control bird. The, all of these top four are control birds at different times during the experiment, pre-dosing, post-dosing, three days post-dosting and two weeks at the end. And on this circle, imagine it's one of these, uh, one of these testing devices. Each point that you see is a different bird that was tested. And so these individuals in, in this group, each bird that's tested independently are orienting sort of north, northeast. The arrow shows the average for the group. And then the length of the arrow shows how strong their migration urge was, how much they were consistent in going in that direction. So for control birds, at the, at the before dosing, dosing, they're going northeast. After getting the fake doses, they're still going northeast. Three days in, they're going north. Two weeks later, they're going north. All these control birds, they are orienting you know, north. But now if we look at the ones with the low pesticide dose, let's look at them. Before they were dosed, they're orienting towards north. Right after they're dosed, they're pretty scattered. Three days after they've been dosed, they really can't orient at all. Look, the, the arrow's pointing down to the southeast here and you have birds going all over the place. But then two weeks after they've been dosed, now they're back going north again. So with these low dose birds, you have correct orientation, then the dose, they, their orientation disappears. And then eventually, two weeks after receiving their last dose, they've recovered. And the same thing happens with the high dose birds. Look here, these birds have no idea where north is. They're just like not, barely moving. And then they're fully recovered two weeks later. So the very last study that I'm going to tell you about tonight was we took, we wanted to know what, what effect would these pesticides have on a wild bird? Because we found massive weight loss and we found lack of orientation. So what would happen if you had a bird that actually could fly if it wanted to? Would it go the wrong way? Or would it just wait until it had recovered and then resume migration? So we did this study at Long Point because they have so many towers in the area. And this was a, like a short, much shorter study because you're dealing with wild birds and you wanna simulate what would happen if they got a single small dose of pesticide. So Margaret caught the birds at Long Point, held them for 24 hours to give them a dose and to see if they lost body weight over that first 24 hour period. And then they used the modus tags to see what happened when the birds were let go after this one day. This graph shows the amount of body fat that they have on their bodies. These are the controls. They were got fake doses. Birds with a very low treatment and birds with a higher treatment. And you can see the birds that got the higher treatment. This is the one with the three seeds of canola. That's the equivalent. They lost 20% of their body fat weight. And we, I'm talking about body fat because body fat is what migratory birds use to fuel their migration. So you all know they put on tons of fat and when they have a large percentage body fat, then they start flying and they can lose all of that body fat in one five hour flight. 
If they don't have enough fat, they can't migrate. This shows food consumption of these birds. I told you earlier, birds get, you know, they feel sick and they don't eat. Here they actually measured food consumption and you can see the birds that, are, that had that one dose of three canola seeds that were treated uh, hardly ever ate, which is why they're losing so much body fat. They just stop eating because they feel too sick. So we wanted to know, uh, so we know what they lost body mass. How about duration of that stopover? Well, how does it affect how long they're grounded, so to speak, before they can resume migration? So birds stop over for different amounts of days. We know that. Um, and the longer the, they're on the ground, the more they're able to eat and regain their body fat. And when their body fat hits a critical level, then they make the decision, I can now migrate again because I've got enough fat you know, to fill the fuel tank, so to speak, so that they can make a decent migration flight. And you can see for these high dose birds, no matter how long the stopover duration, whether it was two days, four days, six days, eight days, their ch chances of leaving that night are about half of what you see for the control and low dose birds. So these birds show the probability of departure always increases the longer the birds being on the ground because they don't have like four week stopovers. As soon as they're ready, they go. So the longer they've been on the ground refueling, the sooner they're gonna be able to leave. But the key here is that the high dose birds have a much lower probability of departing on a given night than, than the controlled or low dose birds. So what does this mean in terms of delays? Exposure to one small dose of pesticide, like once during the day, will delay that bird by four or five days on migration. It really slows them down. So you imagine if a bird is has stopping over and happens to find pesticides or eat pesticides at multiple stopover sites, every time they do this, it's going to slow down their arrival on the breeding grounds by four or five days. So these birds breed in, you know, in, the, in the tundra in northern Canada. Um, we don't know yet what the cumulative delay is for birds that are being exposed to pesticides multiple times on stopover. We just don't know how bad it really is for some of these birds. And interestingly, we also looked at whether they were flying off in the wrong direction. And the answer is no. These are the these X's are the MODIS towers. So they're all along the North shore of Lake Ontario. You probably have one near you. Uh, and it shows for the control birds, they went towards the Northeast, low dose towards the Northeast, even high dose, they went to the Northeast. And we understand why, because our other study in captivity shows that after dosing, birds recover their ability to tell North from South. So a bird that's exposed to these pesticides, um, instead of flying the wrong way, they wait until they're recovered. And the, so the big problem is not sort of sudden death in this case, but it's like, a really long delay in spring migration, and which would it cause a long delay in when they start breeding. So why are songbirds declining? Well, I, I hope I've convinced you there's no easy answer to this question, even for a single species, because different bird species face different threats in different places. So in my talk today, I've, I've told, showed you that winter habitat loss is a big problem for wood thrushes but not for purple martins who winter in the Northern Amazon. Breeding ground neonicotinoids are a big problem for seed eating sparrows like the white crowned sparrow. But this is probably not a problem for wood thrushes who live in forests and don't really encounter agricultural fields a great deal. So basically my conclusion is, you know, from what we've talked about, we don't, there's no one single cause of songbird declines. And, and there's not one cause that explains declines in all our different species. So really we need to do everything we can to be planet and bird friendly. Uh, thank you and I'll be happy to take questions now. Any questions from the room for? Bridget, thank you. It was a great presentation. Thanks. I love I love the combination of technology um, being used for science and and it, and just trying to imagine what the future will hold for further studies. 
Any questions from the room? Go ahead. What does those trackers cost? The cost of the trackers. They're about $200 each. <laughs> so you multiply that by several hundred and that's like, ouch. But uh, luckily, you know, are we, in Canada, we have really good research funding from the NSERC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and you know, private foundations and Environment Canada, lots of different funding sources, because this kind of work has such broad impl implications. I think it, it wasn't hard to raise the funding to, to do it. Any other questions? Go ahead. Are there any tests done on birds, uh, the effect of glycophytes, such as Roundup, on birds? There's no, there's, there, there have been studies um, on testing different kinds of pesticides on other kinds of birds, but most of these are captive studies and they're looking at things like body weight and survival and, you know, what they call LD fifties, which is the lethal dose at which half your birds drop dead. Um, so those kind of basic studies have been done, but I don't, there's only one other study where people have looked at um, migration orientation and whether pesticide, because for migratory birds, it's absolutely critical that they know where they're going and that they can get there on time. Uh, and almost nobody has ever looked at how pesticides affect this critical life stage of trying to migrate, you know, from Pennsylvania to Brazil and back, you know, that, that it's probably a pretty tough job to begin with. And these birds are like so sophisticated in how they orient uh, and all the navigational systems they have, it's very easy to imagine that all kinds of pesticides, which are neurotoxins, could mess up their ability to orient, just like we've shown with these white crown sparrows. Uh, but yeah, the white crown sparrow study is the only recent one in the last 20 years that's, that I know of that's looked at effect of pesticides on birds while they are migrating. Go ahead. Are any of the white crown sparrows arriving uh, in their northern range too late to breed? We don't know because nobody's up there studying them. Um, but, you know, if we had uh, satellite trackers, that would that's my dream to satellite track these tiny birds and know where the, exactly they are every single day. With these white crown sparrows, they don't have modus towers up in the tundra, so we don't know when the birds are arriving up there. Uh, and nobody's really even studying single breeding populations. And like you could put geolocators on breeding white crowned sparrows up there as a study, but then you wouldn't know it, how much they've been exposed to pesticides during their spring migration, because by the time they've arrived, they've already eliminated all those toxins. Uh, so it's so again, like it's really difficult sometimes to answer these really important questions, either because of the remoteness of some of these uh, populations or just like we don't really have the technology yet. Um, you know, for something like white crown sparrow, we need satellite, you know, satellite detections on these birds every single day from from space to be able to really understand, um, again, like you're saying, whether white crown sparrows, if they arrive too late to even successfully breed, we just don't know. Go ahead. Has there been any consideration on how climate change may play a role, especially in terms of departure and all migrations and migrations, that kind of thing? Yeah, we there are, have been so I've done some studies with purple martins um, uh, because you know as, as I said they overwinter in Brazil. And when we were first doing our research, you know, we had a, a particular year, I think it was 2012, where it was the warmest spring on record. Well, it wouldn't be anymore, of course, but back then it was the warmest spring on record. And so we looked at our Purple Martin tracking data to ask whether Purple Martins were able to somehow come back earlier in years where we have these unusually warm and early springs. And we were guessing the answer is no, because gosh, they're down in Brazil. How would they know what the weather's like in, in Southern Ontario? Um, and, in, and indeed, that's what we found. Like even in extremely warm years, um, they, 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 their pace of timing and pace of migration back to North America is exactly the same. And it's not, and so they're already, they're only like a few days from home before they would arrive on the US Gulf Coast and have any way to detect 
that spring is unusually warm. So there can be a mismatch between what's happening with the local weather because of climate change, which affects leaf out, availability of insects, et cetera, everything. Uh, they, we think that, that one of the big effects of climate change will be a mismatch between food supply and when the birds need to feed their offspring. Go ahead. Do you have any hypotheses? You talked a lot about songbird migration decreases, but when you showed the map, there's places where they're increasing. Are there hypotheses why that's happening? Yeah, for the purple martins in particular, they seem to be increasing in many sites in the southern half of the U.S. Um, and purple martins are kind of an odd species to study because they all of the purple martins in eastern North America nest exclusively in birdhouses mostly in people's backyards. So it's hard to imagine that they face sort of environment, like loss of habitat kind of threats in North America because people avidly put out purple martin boxes, uh, condos and try to attract them to their backyards. And people will go so far as to like throw up handfuls of crickets when the weather gets cold and they'll clean the nests out and uh, make sure that there aren't bot fly maggots in the bottom and put predator guards on the poles. So purple martins are pretty pampered throughout much, much of its their eastern range. Uh, so we 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 would think it's hard to think of a reason why they would be declining. There was one recent study that sampled the feathers of purple martins to look for levels of mercury in the feathers. Purple martins bolt or change their feathers on the wintering grounds in Brazil. So that's when they grow in most of their new feathers. Uh, some of them probably are grown in, you know, maybe in Mexico or, or en route. Uh, and they found evidence of mercury in many of the feathers. And uh, so the authors were kind of wondering whether somehow these birds are exposed to sources of mercury um, during migration or on their wintering grounds, which again is a, is a serious toxin and mercury is not eliminated from the body quickly. It's it's stored in the body for long periods of time. Uh, and so they found evidence that there's mercury in the feathers, uh, but the, but again, proving that that is causing declines doesn't is hard. Like we don't know what effect that mercury might be having on their survival or their reproduction or their migration. Uh, that would be the next step for that particular study. Where do you see your next research heading? I'm retiring next year. Oh, oh. what about your team? <laughs> my team, well, my students are, are um, my, my students, Brendan Boyd is doing a postdoc with me right now. He's, he stayed on for an extra year to write up his research and get some teaching experience at the university. And I'm not sure what his long-term plans are. I, I think he's a, he's a field biologist at heart. So I don't think he's gonna, you know, I think he loves doing research, but it's hard to get a research position if you're not working at a university. Not impossible. I mean, you can get jobs with Environment Canada and uh, the Ontario government as well. So may maybe maybe he'll work for uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Climate Change. You know, he would be an excellent candidate for that. Uh, and then my other student, Sue Hayes, um, she's uh, already a senior biologist at the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. So she's actually been doing her PhD part time while she has this challenging full time job. I, I don't know how she does it. But I think I think in terms of um, in terms of the future for migration, bird migration research, um, we are perhaps on the verge of another uh, revolution. And that is that uh, this guy, Martin Wykelski, which I mentioned at the very beginning, who you know ch was chasing birds out of his old station wagon, um, they, they've put a, a, a monitoring device on the International Space Station. And they're currently testing this out to see, to get basically almost like satellite tracking data, but not quite on small birds. Uh, not, not as small as things like wood thrushes and purple martins, but um, they're testing out this new technology to detect birds literally from space. Every time the space station goes around planet Earth, which is multiple times a day, then you get a chance to see where your bird is. So you get multiple hits a day at pretty fine spatial scale. Uh, and this would allow us to answer some of those questions, like do white crowned sparrows that pass through heavily agricultural areas show up late on the breeding grounds? 
So uh, it could be just a matter of years, like a few years before we have this technology available to work on, on songbirds. Somebody Thank has... you. We did, have, we did have one question in the chat from Don McLeod. Yeah. It was, yeah, if you could read it. Can you make use of eBird data or Ontario Dreaming Bird Atlas data to monitor possible delays in migration of the spirit? Oops. Here, one sec. I, I couldn't really understand that, so I'm going to go look at the chat. Okay, uh, can, okay. can you make use of eBird data or Ontario Atlas data to monitor possible delays in migration of sparrows? You could. Uh, at the population level, you could see whether, like, neonicotinoids became really, really common in the late, uh, late, well, by 1995, early 2000s, they became really, really common. So you could look at data over time and see if migration patterns have kind of slowed since the heavy, heavy use of neonicotinoids began. Um, the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, maybe not so much because it's only done every 20 years. And so uh, I'm not, and, and it, it sort of focuses on breeding. Yeah, I'm not sure if the Atlas would really be able to have the, the, the time series that you would need to look at this, but it's, it's a good idea to use eBird data. Definitely, uh, you might be able to do that. Yeah. Okay, well, on behalf of the Willow Beach Field Naturalists, I'd like to thank you for your fascinating talk and your research and please enjoy your retirement. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. I'll keep I'm keeping I'm, I'm going to still write books. I just Oh, I good. Just, okay. Good I'm, I'm going to go live it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much and have a good night everyone and ha and happy celebration that follows. When we had the outings up earlier, uh, it did mention uh, Professor Pricklethorne, who's coming on Sunday. And the slide actually showed um, Peter's Woods, but it will not be at Peter's Woods. It's going to be at the Woodland Trails, which is on Highway 45, north of what was once a ski hill and then became a Boy Scout camp. And I think, Matt, correct me, does it, the forestry now, does the forest own it now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just north of that is the Woodland Trail and a uh, very entertaining um, arborist um, will be there to lead a walk and inform us all about trees. So please join us on Sunday morning for that. 11. Thank you, Richard, for that feed. Um, I'd like to, at this time, formally recognize our past president, Frank Godfrey. Could Frank come up, please? Um, Frank served on our executive for many years before assuming the role of president, which he held for three years, uh, leading the club through our wonderful adventures in Zoom and hybrid meetings, which was certainly not what Frank had signed up for uh, <laughs> for his presidency, but that's what he got. <laughs> As well as completing all the day-to-day -day businesses of the club, Frank could always be counted on to volunteer. He would put his hand up to say, yes, I will sit at that booth and share information. I will hand out pamphlets. I will meet with people. Um, he was the Willow Beach Field Naturalist representative at meetings, if it was Ontario Nature, if it was Northumberland Forest, I can't even name, because I know there's about four and I'll get in trouble if I miss one. Um, but he was, I think, on every committee going for a while. Um, along with Jenny and Jerry, Frank contributed many, many hours to the conservation efforts that are being done at Wesleyville. And I know Frank does continue to work on that because it is a passion near and dear to his heart. Um, it was my pleasure to serve as VP alongside of Frank. So I do um, know <laughs> how much work Frank did. And all the worries, he's a bit of a worrier. So uh, there was many times when he was worrying a lot about how things were going and just because he wanted everything to be exactly good for the club. And so that's really important. And now I have the pleasure of enjoying his knowledge and his insight as he helps me in his role as past president. I have your president's pin <laughs> to present. And I have a very special gift for you. 
And I would ask um, Michael Bigger to come up at this time. Here's your pin. Congratulations. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a beautiful carving that Michael did. And I would like everyone, if you haven't seen one of Michael's carvings before, to please um, take a look at it. Um, very special indeed. Yeah, just put it on the back. Did you want to say anything? Or? Uh, I don't want to say too much other than the fact that I got more out of this club than I ever gave the club. And uh, so the, the people that I've met, wonderful education, and I hope to do it for many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now... 70 years ago, in the summer of 1953, a group of naturalists formed our Willow Beach Field Naturalist Group. 1953. So I don't want to ask if anyone here was a founding member, but <laughs> it would be wonderful to know if you were. Um, in 1956, the first Curly was published. And for anyone who read the last issue of the Curly, they would have seen um, that first issue in order to compare it with our curlew of today. Um, since that time, we've enjoyed engaging speech in speakers, informative hikes. We've given thousands of dollars to other wildlife charities and we've sponsored youth to attend environmental programming. Our contributions to science and conservation include regular bird monitoring, monarch tagging, bio blitz surveys. We've given our local schools monies to promote outdoor education, and we've given graduating students scholarships. Uh, we helped um, probably 20 years ago, um, the Northumberland Land Trust um, become formed, and they now manage 13 land nature reserves. Those are all truly amazing accomplishments for which every one of you can be proud of. I would like to ask at this time, any of our past presidents to please stand um, so that we may acknowledge their dedication to our club. I'd also like to acknowledge any of you who have served on the executive or on one of our committees. I know there's more. I'm going to take your names down if you're not serving on any of these committees. Come on. Just Richard or is everyone else standing? Oh, thank you very much. And finally, of course, I would like to thank you, the membership. You're really what is important. And please lead the way and we'll start our celebration at the back. <laughs> 